things about well having that having it recorded is um, nowadays that people who are not always able to join at this um, well <laughs> at this forsaken a at this forsaken time uh, so for me it's it's 10 p.m. what time is it for you currently uh, five in the afternoon so. oh that's that's not too bad that's not too bad that that's typically the end of a working day then yes and uh, <laughs> for reasons that may not even exist uh, we'll get our daylight savings time switch this coming weekend Yep, so, and then it's. I don't know then, yeah. why we do it a week later than you. <laughs> well, that's that's one of the things. So I I'm actually extremely pro uh, uh, just uh, absorbing the whole daylight savings time altogether, uh, because well, it it had a reason back then, uh, but mm -hmm. those reasons well they 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 still exist, but at a far smaller scale than than back then. So with all the people working on the fields, yada yada yada, yeah, that's like one percent of the, of the working populace nowadays. And uh, right. from what people have said, okay, Archer, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Carl just confirmed that the UK uh, also uh, also switched to uh, uh, to, uh, to to winter time or to as they say GMT proper. Um, so that's always good. Yeah, we had the the switch over here in Central Europe, as well uh, from in the night from um, uh, from Saturday to Sunday as well. And you guys are of course changing on uh, on the coming weekend. And then one of one of the things I've learned uh, the last couple of weeks is that Australia actually is going to introduce a whole new time zone altogether, uh, where um, I think it's the. Uh, the 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 the, the, well, the the province in the mid north of Australia that's going to separate itself from the other mid or central time zone. So they will now have five time zones in Australia or something like that. I'll probably be uh, <laughs> I'll probably be <laughs> corrected somewhere uh, down the line. Um, but I think that we've got um, we've got some people in the channel. The recording is running. It's three minutes past the hour. Um, so, uh, uh, Graham, just for you, what we're going to see is we'll, uh, we're we're going to see some people coming in, uh, leaving. We're going to see a lot of people just changing uh, across. Um, so, don't no worries there whatsoever. Um, but let's just kick this off, right? Are you ready? Sure. <laughs> Great. Um, so, again, welcome everyone to the uh, Modular Clubhouse. Uh, my name is Jesper. Uh, you've, you've you've all seen me before, at least uh, that's what I'm assuming. And today we are graced by Graham from Sono Current, uh, who will uh, be our special guest for today. As always, um, I do have to put a big disclaimer here and say, well, we are recording this session again, so this will be uh, shared with both the uh, the patrons on Patreon. Uh, but also with uh, the well, the the modular clubhouse Discord channel, and um, maybe that Graham wants to share it with some of his uh, his peeps as well. Um, this is of course the companion show for the uh, for the YouTube channel, and well, if you've got any questions about the YouTube channel, just wait until the end, and we can answer any questions that you might have there. We do have the companion channel, as always, uh, ready to go. Um, so if you have any questions, any comments, and you aren't, aren't are unable to join the uh, the Q and A later on, uh, but you still want to ask a question, uh, just drop your uh, um, your questions there. If you've got a useful link on things that we are discussing, just drop them there as well. Um, so first things first. Well, um, I'm always so happy that I get to spend a good amount of time with with our guests before we open it up to Q and A. So first things first, Graeme, how are you doing? Oh, uh, well enough, I should say. Hmm? Um, yeah, doing fairly well. <laughs> fairly well, fairly well. That's <laughs> that's of course always an interesting statement to uh, to make. And is that um, uh, more in the uh, um, in the the professional sono current way or? Oh, uh, as always, everything is slower than I imagine it's going to be. I, I kind of suspect most people say that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I just introed some new modules at Superbooth back in September, and they were, of course, going to ship by the end of the month. And, yeah. well, here we are in November, and 
yeah well then um <laughs> Be fair, one of them is sitting here on the table, ready to go out the door. But oh, uh, nice! And it's uh, uh, is that the the MC two A or? Yes, it's the crossfade unit. Is MC three A? Oh, poor apologies for uh, for mis mislabeling that. So that well, is oh wow, that's great. That's that's already one of my questions I already had, and we were answering that in the first couple of minutes. <laughs> So that's you know I, I, so that's when I say well, fairly well because I'm excited about that and mm -hmm. less excited that its companions are hung up a little bit. Uh, yeah, component yeah. shortage is not been oh, good yeah. to any of us, I think. So it's something that is a recurring theme in this show, uh, especially when we talk to uh, uh, to Eurorack makers or makers in general. Um, everyone's impacted across the board. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we do see, of course, is that we do see some Eurorack makers making uh, making some changes, uh, switching over from digital to, to analog modules, for instance. Um, has that in any way, shape or form um, influenced your plans uh, for going forward? Uh, not so much in a digital to analog sense. Um, when I first started this, idea some years ago i thought i might get tempted to go into digital or you know maybe like fpga based mm -hmm. modules but um i don't have anything against them so much as i just decided that i really enjoy the analog aspect so mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future that's where i will stay is uh, yeah. fully analog and i think uh, if I ever run into something I feel I really absolutely must make that mm -hmm. must be digital to be sensible, I would reconsider it then. But for now, it's uh, all the things I'm imagining making in the next several years are fully analog. So, Yeah, great, of course. So um, for the, the people who are unaware of Sono Currents, uh, your first module, the MT2D, uh, was, of course, a, a fully analog tube-based uh, distortion module, um, which I still <laughs> play with, uh, well, every, every day, I should say. It's still part of my rack. And so how how did that came to be? How did that, how, how did you come up with a plan for that specific module to be your very first one? Uh, that was, maybe I'll give a two-part answer. Yeah, sure. One is I absolutely love distortion. Mm-hmm just aesthetically and for the music i am interested in the music i wish to make uh, i'm always fascinated by varying degrees and varying flavors of distortions whether it's more gentle saturations or just you know absolutely ludicrous <laughs> decimation of sounds i just to me that's a wonderful area to explore that you know some people i think say oh well distortion that's just you know distortion it's like well there's a lot of subtlety in something that at first glance may not seem subtle mm -hmm. and uh so that was an appeal so i always wanted to make a distortion and i've i was interested in the idea of doing something with tubes that uh there have been other modules that are tube based of course metasonics and erica since and uh a few others have of course done it but it's not something you see often mm -hmm. and uh I looked at a lot of new old stock tubes and found had some misgivings about going that direction because it's always a sourcing issue of well, what happens if your supply dries up of those you know, yeah. strange 1970s miniature tubes. Um, so around that time, I found out about the new tube that's in that unit, and uh, they had just started to become available mm -hmm. to uh, manufacturers who weren't Korg. And, um, because <laughs> that's who was behind it and yeah, yeah no one had really come out with anything yet with it so i thought well actually you know what there's maybe my first module because i feel like i need to make something that's different but speaks to where i'm heading and no one seems to have touched that yet now as it turns out uh plankton electronics actually completely unknown to me was developing a uh, tube-based distortion module at the same time with the new tube. So they announced it almost exactly the same time I announced mine. And 
Oh wow! Sort of funny. <laughs> that, <laughs> like, that's a Graham Bell kind of story, having having the same idea and coming up with the same technology at the same time. Well, I think it's funny that uh, I was speaking to uh, the folks from Chaos Devices at Superbooth this year about things, and uh, so they, of course, have some stereo processor modules that they just announced, mm-hmm. and um, your analog has just done this, and I have some on the drawing board that. I didn't announce. <laughs> we were talking about that, and, and they said something like, "Well, it does seem like there are these ideas that none of us are sharing with each other, but somehow it just seems like it's time is right." And this year, everyone's doing these stereo enhancement and stereo filter and like mid-side things mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that no one was talking about three or four years ago, and. Uh, I feel like a couple of years ago, there were people looking at different distortions all at the same time, and I don't know where that comes from, but it's rather, rather curious to me. It's 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 an interesting phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, so, uh, I think of course it's it's a, it's an organic development within Eurorack where the um, the free flow of ideas is of course paramount within the community itself, and also people and the community being quite vocal in what they need. Maybe that mm-hmm. might be driving. That 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 that's well, diaspora of ideas. That certain ideas pop up at the same time. I agree, and I also think one of the things that's wonderful about Eurorack is, uh, for the most part, there aren't really any follow-on kind of designs. It's not like someone came out with a certain distortion or a certain other thing, and everyone else was like, "We can make that." Mm-hmm. Everyone does their own thing. No, absolutely, oh. absolutely. And it's you know another manufacturer I admire is a animal factory amplification and you know he's got his Orbos module out and I don't have one yet but I'd like to get one and uh, it's you know you see someone else does a tube VCA or tube distortion I'm like okay well his tubes are different <laughs> than my tubes so I've got to have one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've only I've only worked with one of the. Um, uh, the Animal Factory amplification modules, which is their uh, their mixer, but I've seen the Eurobus and I've been really intrigued by that. Mm-hmm. And uh, but have have you had hands on experience with that? Not with that one. Uh, I wanted to pick one up earlier this year, but external forces being what they are, I yeah. haven't gotten back around to it. And I was actually just thinking about that recently. So that's maybe why it came to mind as we're talking just now. It's like, I really should get back to him and be like, oh, <laughs> by the way, um, I didn't forget about that. I'd still like to buy one of those if they're still around. But uh, oh, maybe do a, sw- do a swap or something. Yeah, I think, I, I think maybe that's kind of coming back around to like, well, how did I pick that module? It's like, the mm-hmm. beauty of Eurorack is so many flavors and so many approaches and so many methodologies that it's great to be unique, but there's also always room for one more way of doing something. Um, Absolutely, and and especially when it comes to um, these really, well, uh, taste-driven things like distortion, because... Of course, well, if you, if you talk about a, a sequencer, it either it either jives with you or it doesn't. But when it comes to things like the, the real analog things like distortion, reverb, uh, those kind of things, then personal taste and preference really shines. And I've had the, the luxury of, 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 of reviewing several distortion units and I've actually been able to figure out what the slight nuances, nuance differences are between them. Uh, but I think that that is because of the uh, the nature of the of the modules, just like you would have with reverb or maybe even with delays. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, but you said it's, you've uh, you, you one of the things you uh, I wanted to pick up on this. Is you said you've always been intrigued by um, by distortion and those kind of effects. So wh- wh- where did you come from from a from a musical upbringing uh, point of view? Oh, I'll start at the beginning. It's probably yeah, easier sure. than going <laughs> back in time. Sure. I think. Uh, actually, my first instrument was piano, classical Great. piano. Nice. Uh, would have been about five, maybe four, but I think I was five years old when I started playing piano. Wow. 
Um, also played horn. Some some people say French horn, but mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. And somewhere, maybe in adolescence, I discovered metal, as you do. <laughs> as one does. Oh, don't you worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, friend. <laughs> um, and it's funny because, and I don't know how it was for you in you know what what exact era we might be talking about but mm-hmm. it, here in the eastern u.s in the 80s and 90s um in the metal scene you didn't mention things like synthesizers um that was sort of taboo mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um but i've always felt this and i think it's something that's become more clear to me over time is the guitar sounds I liked in metal, and I should add that once I got into metal, it was sort of an arms race of finding the heaviest, most blisteringly <laughs> um, abrasive metal possible, um, which is actually how I eventually got out of metal, too. It's funny how that works, but the point is, in a way, that becomes synthesis, actually. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're taking a vibrating string and putting it through so many absurd gain stages and EQs and compression and whatever else people are doing to get their particular sound that um, it, it's kind of like mm-hmm. a, a, a synthesis approach, even though I think the majority of people doing it would maybe not think of it that way or maybe not want to admit it. But uh, I was always interested in synthesizers at the same time because I would have come from an era that would have known Doctor Who and the early Star Wars and, yeah, you know, that's I think I told you privately some months ago because you were yeah. like, where did your crazy module names come from? And I said, well, it is actually kind of a split between chemical formulas and droid names from, you know, without yeah, giving out specific absolutely. Star Wars reference. It's kind of like, well, they're droids. Um, it's a little goofy, but you know, it works. Well, it works. And, and like, then there is there is no shame within the Eurorack community. That's another thing I truly I truly appreciate, and it's yes. a safe space in that regard. And so I think you know, musically, I've always been interested in um, stretching an exploration of sound. Mm-hmm. So when I think back to metal and like, especially because I've in the past few years gotten back into listening to some of that. And I find without naming names, I find there are some bands that I pick up again. And I like, I loved this when I was, you know, 17 years old and I listen to it now and I'm like, "Uh, well, okay, whatever happened. I don't love it now. We don't need to hear that again. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of it is really much more timeless. And I think that comes down to the sound uh, lyrics. I could probably, take or leave a lot of times now just given where my life is but the sound was always a thing so at some point i started to discover more and more electronic music and then of course the late 80s and early 90s you'd have more and more crossover between heavier styles of music and more experimental forms of music that were things that fell outside sort of the pop and rock Mm -hmm. worlds as well as electronic things that um and did that then lead you down more down the industrial route? or That's what I was going to say. Is yeah. I think that leads us into industrial, whatever that means. I, I know you, that's one of those things that you talk to 10 people. What is industrial music? You will get 11 10 different completely answers. different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, at least 10 completely different answers. And some people will probably change their mind tomorrow. Absolutely. Um, so that certainly led that way. And I think it's like the idea of shaping raw sound was always the interest. So coming from mutilating your guitar sound as badly as possible to, Mm -hmm. oh, okay, well, I can start with like these basic principles of sound generation and then the sky's the limit with synthesizers. And at that time, Mm -hmm. you could still pick up some obsolete, unwanted analog synths uh, cheaply. And I, I am afraid I don't have any great stories of like you know, that gigantic modular system I bought in the early '90s for a hundred dollars <laughs> or anything like that. I, I know people have those, but um, my my two cents, first two series since I had were a Juno 106 and a nice. Prophet 600. Oh wow! Which were not the super 
popular ones at the time. I think when I started to pick up gear, like the Juno 60 and the Jupiter 8 were already starting to get a little bit of vintage attention when people were really mm-hmm. looking for those. And the, the Profit 5 was already starting to get a little expensive on the used market, but I got a 600 and loved it. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, but now, those course, are, those... of course, already quite uh, respectable uh, uh, vintage since already when, when you started, of course. Yes. And uh, then I'm not an analog purist, so I picked up a couple of interesting uh, digital things that would have been mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of that time. Uh, probably the standout being a Kawhi K5000. Oh, wow. The whole idea of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, was that the one that uh, Bad Gear did a video on last week? I don't know. Oh, let me just. I have to look for this. Yeah, I'm just. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna check that real quickly. So it's an Austrian guy with a beautiful accent, and he he has this great uh, bad gear. And let me just see if I can find him real quickly. Uh, it's the additive synth. Yeah, he he did a video on the Kawaii K12. Sorry, yeah. Oh, okay. So that's probably like a predecessor of the one you you had. Yeah, the K5000, uh, someone else might correct me. I think it had, it was at least 128 partials. It might have actually been a 256 partial additive synth with formant filters. Mm. And um, so given my mindset, when that thing came out, I was like, Oh, you mean I get to build the sound like quite literally with like individual harmonics? Okay, yes, please. <laughs> and um, apparently, almost no one else in the '90s wanted to do that, so I don't think that synth lasted a whole, whole lot of, whole, too many years. I think it didn't sell terribly well. But I loved that thing. Of the things I've gotten rid of over the years, that's one of the few things I do kind of sometimes think oh, I kind of wish I still had that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not actually real hung up on vintage gear or, you know, trying to re- relive that time. But it's a, mm-hmm. it was just such a unique thing, and no one's really done it in quite yeah. that way since. So, yeah, but I, I I do expect that we will see some some sort of revival on the mid '90s or early '90s since because there's a lot of attention going on from. Uh, not just Eurac people, but uh, w- with synth enthusiasts trying to re- revisit that sound. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see that uh, picking up some steam, either with uh, the likes of um, of synth manufacturers building those kind of synths, or Eurac makers trying to emulate that sound as well. Mm-hmm. That's and I, yeah, yeah, I, I think that is uh I think aesthetically, there's certainly people who want to revisit that some some of the genres that were big at that time. Absolutely. Um, but I think in some cases also, just people are starting to appreciate early to like mid generation digital. Really did have kind of a vibe about it that it's not analog, but it's interesting in its own way. Absolutely, and and. And one of the things I, I, I did want to follow up on is you said, well, um, your your metal journey brought you to the most extremes of metal. And what I think, and I, I, I was born in 83, so I unfortunately wasn't um, actively part of the, the late 80s thrash metal um, uh, genesis, uh, but I was able to consciously be part of the late 90s and early uh, early 2000s um, development of metal unfortunately part of that was also new metal uh, but of <laughs> course all <laughs> but also a lot of the um, uh, the European black metal and within yes. within black metal of course there you had the the the, 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 the two ways and where you had the more symphonic black metal where you did hear, orchestral sounds and synthesizers and all of that and you had the what they back then called the true cult black metal the norwegian lo-fi cassette mm-hmm. uh, black metal and 
personally, for uh, listening to what you're saying, you're 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 you're, you're already um, <laughs> you're already teaching me a lot about how I ended up here uh, by just listening to your story there. And my thought is actually that the um, the ease with which you can then evolve from metal into synthesizers would be more through the true cult black metal where it is indeed all about so soundscapes, ambient, um, distortion, um, well, just influencing your, your string sounds and then just have very sharp blast beats on top of that instead mm -hmm. of focusing on the orchestral uh, playings of bands like Dimmu Borgir or, or others like that. Right, and I would have been. I, I would have heard some of the black metal mm -hmm. in maybe the early '90s. Uh, yeah. I would have probably been much more familiar with uh, death metal of either the Swedish yeah, yeah, variety, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, or the the Florida death metal scene. Yeah, yeah. Not that I'm from there, but it, it, it somehow that landed in my lap and. Um, yeah, because then of course in the, the whole the, the whole Florida Bay Area where you had bands like like Deicide and yes. um, um, uh, Cannibal Corpse, those those kind of bands, and then you had the the, the, the Swedish the the, the so-called Gothenburg sound mm -hmm. with bands like 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 In Flames at the Gates, um, right. those kind of ones, and I think that that's a that's a nice. Well, uh, that's a nice um, comparison if you then take black metal as well, because I, I do see the same, um, well, uh, different approach to sound design, or as we would now say, well, how do you shape your sounds? How do you actually go about that from a synthesizer point of view? So that's, that's an interesting. Um, so, so how did you then actually evolve from 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 death metal to probably then industrial and and into into synthesizers? A uh, couple of things. One, uh, one other. I think kind of pivotal. I don't want to overstate it, but you know, <laughs> I think we all we all encounter an album that makes us realize that something that's been in the back of our minds is possible. Yeah, and someone out there is already doing something of that nature. And for me, that would have to be the first time I encountered Godflesh. And, oh, uh, interesting. Because it's this relentlessly bludgeoning heavy guitar, yeah. and that bass sound is just fascinating. Um, if we really wanted to do, we could probably do a whole chat session about <laughs> those bass sounds. But, um, but then they've got a drum machine. And like I said, where I came from in the metal scene, like you didn't talk about drum machines and synths because it was, you know... There was this stigma that they weren't real instruments, and I never bought into that. I always thought mm -hmm, that was mm -hmm. utter rubbish. But um, so hearing Godflesh the first time, uh, certainly the Street Cleaner album, but then also especially when Selfless came out, and it was like where that went sonically it was this will sound slightly, you know, yeah, cheesy or corny, but it's like when you first hear someone making something that kind of aligns with the sound that's been in your head and you're like, yes, that's possible. That's, that's somewhere we can go and there's someone leading the way, but that's fine. Um, and so I think like some of that, uh, that was one transition of uh, skinny puppy. Mm -hmm. which is by no means a guitar band would yeah. have been one of them where you in fact precisely because it's not guitar oriented it's also the, some of the densest darkest uh, you know heaviest in a certain way of speaking music around at that time it's, it's like okay here's a way to make this very intricate very intriguing dark and aggressive and heavy music that's not really what mm -hmm. most people say when they think of heavy music in the terms of metal or rock, but it's um, obviously some of the better known things like Nine Inch Nails and Ministry and of so forth so. would have been in my uh, in my collection of tapes at the time too. But uh, it's uh, that's probably where the transition really happened. And I played some guitar as a mm -hmm. as a teen, but I was 
not an excellent guitar player, I guess <laughs> I'll say. Uh, adequate, maybe. Um, and the idea of like being able to come back to these sorts of like very hard sounds, very harsh sounds, and explore that territory, but mm -hmm. in a way that was not necessarily um, guitars, basses, and drums, and, you know, screaming. Yeah, but, <laughs> but still have the um, the availability of take your sounds to those extremes, and that, and that is, of yes. course, something that's appealing. Yes. Oh, wow. And I think, and maybe I feel like I should hasten to add, like, the going to those extremes was not, for me, always about shock or, you mm -hmm. know, aggression or something like that. It was just the idea of, like, undiscovered country. It's like, you know, here's a sound. That I wonder if anyone's ever done something with this. It's like, you know, but since wow. through pedals, I mean, not that that's rare. Lots of people do it, but yeah, exactly what synth, exactly what pedal, and exactly what are you doing with it is always going to be unique. So uh, I like maybe that. that's how yeah. modular becomes so appealing. Well, and, and to be honest, I do have to thank you because this, this, this does open up some avenues for thoughts. Uh, that I've never, never, never dreamt about before. So I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll probably go down this rabbit hole a bit further to understand exactly how this brought me to where I am right now. Because it's, a, uh, it's, it's a great approach and how you explain that. And I've never thought about it that, that way. So how, how did that then evolve into into Eurorack? So did you actually? Um, do a lot of Eurorack before you actually decided to start uh, Sword of Current? Oh, uh, a few years. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, we're leaving the you know, late or the uh, early to mid 90s, at which point I, I took a break from music, which mm -hmm. is sort of an odd story in itself. But yeah. the short version is I decided I, need, I also I was trained as a graphic designer and music mm -hmm. was always a side thing and at some point I decided I needed to concentrate on my visual work and uh, I'll just say don't ever do that if I... <laughs> <laughs> never stop doing something um, yeah because you know 25 years later here I am uh, so some years ago I, I wanted to get back to music because it's like you know several times a year it would eat at me that I'd left that behind and finally, I was like, why do I let that eat at me when I could just go mm -hmm. make something? Mm -hmm. So I had a decent computer for the photography and design work I did. And I thought, you know what? There are all these great, like, plugins and, like, software instruments that, like, I don't have to buy any stuff. I can just, you know, buy some, mm -hmm. you know, modest investment of software and go make some music again. And I, so I bought a bunch of things and I did absolutely nothing with them <laughs> because I just didn't like you know, mousing around on a computer to make my music. I don't yeah. have anything against it. Other people have made glorious albums that way. Yeah. It just wasn't speaking to me in terms of recapturing what drew me in in the first place. So at some point, I want to say probably 2015, I started to pick up hardware again. And um, maybe 2014, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. I was like, you know what? It's I can start to pick up a few little things that, get back into that and uh the modular scene of course at that point was i remember seeing an ad back in the 90s for like the first dev for modules and mm -hmm. i never saw any in person back then but i remember like always passing that ad in the magazines and thinking like oh my gosh how amazing <laughs> would that be um because the university i went to for undergraduate had a while i was there largely non-functional moog 55 system oh no wow and um so I never got to play it because it, it was not in good working order while I was there, but it uh -huh. uh, sat in the corner and made me think. And so, uh, you know, getting back to the present, I would say I probably about 2015, I had picked up a couple of little standalone items, but uh, mm -hmm. Korg Mini Log, which is a nice synthesizer. I don't yeah. care for the mini keys personally. Coming from a piano, the mini keys, and I never quite got one. But um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. modular then was what I really started to think about. I was like, that's always what spoke to me. And I never, as a student in the 90s, never had the, uh, frankly, never had the means mm -hmm. to explore. Course, but yeah. uh, 
here here it is it's 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 somewhat easier to get your hands on at this point it's yeah. so much more variety it's not just uh analog systems in depth for doing it and uh i think i remember some early shaman and things like the scene stuff like that yeah the, was it frack rack the other format that was around that i don't know if anyone even still builds for that um so I don't think I... that I've heard that name in quite some time. Of course, Schwemann is, of course, being being restarted now, but the, yeah, the uh, frack, no, no, I don't think so. Yeah, it's, uh, I want to say the frack rack was a for you format. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong about that, though. I've never actually, I've never actually had hands on those. Um, and, of course, I would have heard tales of, like, you know, Surge and, Boot club mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff still floating yeah, course, around yeah. that people had access to, but I personally did not. Um, so yeah, I would say I started the preliminary work on Sona Current in 2017. Oh wow! And, uh, Already back then. Yeah, very preliminary. Started the work on the distortion module in like late 2017. <sighs> Uh, yeah, actually, really early 2018. There's there's a little piece of story I'll I'll kind of gloss over because it probably mm -hmm. doesn't warrant too much. Too yeah, no much worries. Time, we've, so. we've 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 got more than enough time. <laughs> it's it's as long uh, as you want it to be, Graham. No worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 2017, I initially started working on something else, and there was someone who was going to work with me on it. And uh, I'll simply, I I don't like saying negative things i'll simply say that didn't work out mm -hmm. and um that module kind of got shelved permanently mm. and um aspects of what that might have been have become what the crossfader is now the mc3a ah. um my idea for a crossfader and kind of was somewhere between the thing that no one will ever see and the MC3A that is out now. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Because it got whittled down to something less than I had imagined. And then, like I said, that got canceled because that relationship just didn't really work. Yeah. And uh, the, the new MC3A is sort of like, okay, well, what did I think a crossfader should be? And then adding to that some things that have occurred to me since then. So uh, in a way, it's not so bad that... No, so so it's, a, it's an evolution of that original idea, you might yes. say. Yeah. Um, because the original one really was just three... Frankly, it was really closer to being three separate crossfaders in one housing, which isn't... Yeah, yeah. It didn't have the integration in the, of the two parallel stages feeding the center one, which at some point occurred to me, well, I mean, why would I give you three in one housing when I could give you one in one housing and you could just buy three of them if you needed them? So yeah. what, make, what makes using three crossfaders actually important? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you, you teach yourself things about this or you're like, well, okay, this is idea that really strikes me, but why? What, what is it that actually makes it? useful as presented um mm -hmm. yeah be it workflow or ergonomics or just the simplicity of like sure you could put that together with a whole bunch of attenuators and vcas and so and forth mixers, but, yeah of course yeah yeah but you you'd have like you know an entire row <laughs> yeah <laughs> take it take it's like like ATHP that. uh worth of yeah. modules yeah and um and it would be a bit of a monster to tweak and you know the same thing with the other new module i have the macro controller it's like well, yes you can do that with or you can do something very close well, not even very close you can do something in that direction with enough vcas and attenuators and mm -hmm. other pieces and by the macro controller and... you you mean the cg f4 you mean yes okay yeah and so uh those this is a kind of a roundabout answer, and we'll we'll come back to 2018 soon enough. But the uh, <laughs> I think both of the things that are new now are my idea of like when is a utility module not a utility module? 
and how much of how you interact with an instrument is because of the utility it's because of the connective pieces it's we all really love to dwell on filters especially and mm -hmm. oscillators and so forth but a lot of times what really for me is most amazing about an instrument is like well how did they how did they stick all the bits together mm -hmm. yeah and so naturally in modular that's a that's a choice that the artist has so i think Everyone who's you know had hands on these things so far has been impressed with them, but it's mm -hmm, you sometimes mm -hmm. will encounter someone who's like you know, so it's a crossfader, okay? I'm like, mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. yes, but <laughs> no, no, it, no. But it, just think know. about the applicability of that, because of course, right. a crossfader is a crossfader. But if you then say, well, you can use that crossfader to feed into your oscillator, or you can use that to, right. uh, and, and that's one of the beauties there, of course, as well, and and. and and how does this fascination with that utility and the applicability within a sound designing workflow, how does that relate back to that Kawaii uh, K5000 where you said, okay, well, here we can actually go in and tweak every little bit that I wanted. Absolutely. Yeah. And now the catch mm -hmm. is, you know, if we're back in the mid nineties and you're programming your K5000 on a little LCD screen with a single encoder and a couple of buttons. Um, a nightmare an workflow. Immense, yeah. Yeah, there was an immense amount of depth in that synth, but yeah. um, you, you needed to put in some time to really get something out of it. And I kind of enjoy that, but I also respect that a great many people have other things to do with their time. So, <laughs> um, you know, you'd have these nights where you're like, okay, I just spent how many hours in the, you know, sitting in front of my keyboard and I, what did I do? I programmed a sound and I might keep working on it tomorrow. And I made no music, you know, so I'm mm -hmm. guilty of that still. It's kind of just how I work, but, um, yeah. But it's, isn't that uh, true for most of the uh, the modular community where we look at sound and sound design like um, like a painter looks at its uh, like 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 their own first uh, still life where they say they mm -hmm. keep tweaking on it until they say well this is the sound I want to work with absolutely and I think there's nothing wrong with that no absolutely yeah. um. Like I'll, I'll be candid and say I have not yet released a, a you know a record of any kind, and I've I've been sort of threatening to for a very long time, and <laughs> <laughs> um, I keep joking about it now. It's like you know, the end of the year I might come out with that recording I've been threatening to do since the nineties, um, and I'm going to go ahead and say it's not happening this year. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's you know. It, it's the journey, not the end result. Yeah, somewhere in the summer, I thought it was happening this year. Oh, wow. And um, then I realized, no, I'm so preoccupied with you know, getting the modules going mm -hmm. that I have less time to make my own things anyway. But it's also, uh, you know, who, I, don't, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I mean, who cares if I release my music this year or <laughs> next year no one's waiting as long as you keep enjoying what you do right right and meanwhile i'm having a blast so yeah. um you know I, I have other hardware since here still that will draw me in and i can spend an entire evening just making a couple of couple of presets for them and it's you know nothing wrong with that no, absolutely. and obviously the modular is the same way as you well know you Five hours later, you're like, oh, I should get to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, and you say, oh, geez, I need to get up at 7 again. <laughs> yes. We've all so been I, there. I th yes, definitely. And so I think, you know, going back to bringing the, you know, something like the K5000 or any, any of the other really complicated digital sense of that era in is, you know, the obvious appeal of modular being everything's out in front and mm -hmm. hands on and a few people I know uh, who are not necessarily musicians but know what I do or 
kind of you, you can tell they're sort of intrigued by it they're like i kind of want to know how that works but i wouldn't even know where to start and there's just so much there's so many functions so many controls all those cables going everywhere and i was like well you see the thing is so that's actually what makes it easier yeah because it's all switches and knobs and cables you you can once you know what all the basic principles and you know basic blocks that you're building with are you can go anywhere with it and you're not staring through a two-line lcd screen trying to figure out what yeah. that abbreviation is again <laughs> <laughs> no but that, that's one of the things that I, I i do hear back from um uh from friends who's who, who at first are intimidated by a a modular synthesizer but then once they start and diving a bit deeper into it they say well okay well now i understand now i understand it's a lure now i understand why we haven't been seeing you around because you've been spending way too much time <laughs> with your modular synth right it's uh it's something i think that modular just it doesn't just invite exploration but it, it invites personal exploration um, absolutely and it's and it's one of the things that i truly feel is is therapeutical as well just to patch something and just to work with something and just well, let's dive right in and and just say well what happens if i do this this and then and from 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 a lot of the interviews i've done is I've, I've interviewed people uh, very neurotypical, uh, neuroatypical, and everything in between. And I think that everyone that I've talked to has said that they have improved their mental health due to modular, just by having that 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 almost well meditative approach to I'm just going to create a sound and that's it. Mm -hmm. well, that's beautiful uh, but I, 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 we, we, we are getting out of a tangent because we were still planning on going into uh, 2018 yes yes uh, so I think you had asked me you know, what the development was and yeah yeah the how, how did that how did that how did that in, in how did that actually evolve from uh, going into modular and uh, to actually say well now I'm just gonna I'm going to dive right in and I'm going to design my first module uh, at Sono Current. So I, um, in that time frame, I, I started to think, okay, well, I have these ideas as we've just been mm -hmm. on a tangent about, yeah. about the importance of utility modules. Yeah. But the reality is in the market, that's a, that's a challenge to get everyone excited about some of those things um yeah people want something that makes noise and makes an interesting noise when it comes down to it so i thought okay well you know what for my first module i better do something that just you know oversimplifying this a bit but you know, i need mm -hmm. to make something that makes a cool noise um so given my interest in distortion as i alluded <laughs> earlier that's sort of where i landed on that i also felt that it was something i could tackle without some of the intricacies of say a filter where it's like okay well I, w I want to make a filter and i have ideas about a filter but making a filter that has not it's not already ground that's quite well tread by others is not a simple task um i'm not interested in making another ladder filter mm -hmm, clone mm -hmm. or another you know choose your favorite filter from the past yeah. kind of you know, revival or homage to that. Um, it's already been covered quite well by other people, and I, I, I don't feel that I need to contribute another. So if, if, if I bring out, well, when I bring out a filter, I want it to do something else. Yeah. So the distortion came about because I was like, well. In that, in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And so the other aspect of. Uh, getting the distortion out was I should mention having some excellent outside help on that from uh, Eric Schlappi at Schlappi Engineering yeah um, kind of came in on a freelance basis and worked with me on that because yeah, that was one of the questions I want to ask so how did that mm -hmm. 
collaboration with Eric Schlappi uh, came to be? Uh, because I was sort of building this, you know, from the start. And as I said, my, my background is as a musician and as a graphic designer and photographer and visual artist. And I thought, okay, well, I know many things about what I'm trying to do, but I don't have all of the pieces. And I, the first module was built out at uh, Dark Place Manufacturing in Portland. Yeah. Um, who also make the Maleco heavy industry modules and pedals. And uh, they've made modules for other people as well. So I thought I'd have them build the first one. And, um, you know, knowing I needed some help really getting things right and... Oh, uh, because I sort of had my vision, but it's like, well, is that really the best way to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. lay that out and so forth? I um, I actually got in touch with Eric through Dark Place because I went out there in 2018 too. Okay. So you reached out to them for uh, to discuss the actual design of your module then? Or? Well, I, I went out there to discuss the manufacturing, but then I was like, by the way, you know, the person that was kind of going to be, you know, working on this with me is mm -hmm. just, you know, we've just parted way. So in order for me to keep the ball rolling, um, you guys wouldn't happen to know someone who might be interested in doing a module on a freelance basis with, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. working with me on it so that I can keep going and uh yeah that's uh that's they gave me his <laughs> name and i you know was like oh no actually i think they just i gave them my info and it's like well if you know someone you know maybe pass my info along and got a call awesome. from him like you know that day <laughs> and, and at that time of course eric was of course quite a a legend within the uh, the modular uh, space right yeah he had come out with uh I know he had the interstellar radio out already, and I, I'm thinking, I think the angle grinder was either just out or was about to come out. Okay, yeah. So he definitely had some momentum, and um, he's a great guy, so that's why also I want to be sure to acknowledge him on that, because that yeah. module would have, it either would have not happened, or honestly, it would have happened much slower without some outside input. Um, as I was kind of, you know, finding my wings. No, but still, I, I think that, would you go as far as say that Eric was a kind of a mentor already? Or was it just, okay, well, we, we need this designed. Okay, well, he's done it and that's it. Uh, I don't know if mentor is quite the right mm -hmm. arrangement because uh, it was sort of handed things back and forth. But um, but still, with taking your input and then changing your idea and 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 your vision and and to uh, and 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 then taking that and making that a reality. Yeah, and like like for instance, on that module, uh, the CV control of the tube bias was mm -hmm. something I thought about putting in. Yeah, and then took out because I thought I don't know, I don't know if anyone would actually do that, and I don't know whether it's even a really good idea. Like mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, because you you because you, you could start running the tube at its extremes, and uh, I don't know, do I really want to do that? And, and so I kind of dropped it. It was in like an early sketch, and I kind of dropped it. And one day Eric was like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like since we're playing with the bias, why don't you just put a CV control on that? And I was like, you think so? Okay, well, yeah, uh, funny that you mentioned that because I kind of thought about that and dismissed it because I was like not sure anyone else would actually ever want to do that. And so that that's the nice thing about having other voices and something is... You need to have your soundboard, of course. You need to have that... Right. That, 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 well, you need to have a, a surrounding of peers to, uh, to bounce those ideas off of. And I do s expect that... While modular is a very social uh, activity, as we are a very welcoming and open community as a whole, uh, but it is something that you will need to go actively 
after if you want to get some uh, real honest feedback and say okay well how can we improve something and because it's it's not probably not something that you could just ask your your neighbor and say well what do you think of this but now you need to start, you need to have some feedback from someone in the know right and it's funny that you bring that up because a little anecdote from my early design phase on um part of what i was doing in the early months of starting sauna current was actually working on uh interface design yeah because i Obviously, I start with what functions I want a module to have, but almost simultaneously, I'm working on the interface. Mm -hmm. And then that mm -hmm. helps dictate, okay, well, guess what? We can't fit all of those functions and have decent ergonomics, which is very important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, or on the other hand, I might come up with a you know lovely interface or something and be like, oh, you know what? There's space on this. Hmm. <laughs> well, when you have an empty space, maybe there was something you weren't sure about adding that you can go ahead and put in there. Let's see. So I came up with like an entire like design rule system prior mm -hmm. to the first module, which a sec which I wanted to have to sort of dictate where everything would go, so that someday when there's a full sauna current system, everything makes sense together. Mm -hmm. Um. And so I spent a lot of time doing that, and I did get feedback from people who do not use synths and are not musicians on things like knob spacing and uh, other control spacing. And it was funny because they're always like, but what does it do? I'm like, you don't need to know what it does. Just turn the knob. Can you turn the knob? Do you like turning the knob? Or is it kind of tight with that other thing over there? And they're like, yeah, I kind of bumped that switch when I turn that knob. But what does that knob do? I'm like, don't worry about it. Just <laughs> So I got a lot of early feet in that kind of bizarre way where like we all had to pretend that like you know everyone no, still, actually you, knew what was going on yeah but, um, but you do talk about that well that design language or um the 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 overall uh theme of your your modular rig and, and that's something that you've clearly thought about before actually even releasing the uh uh the empty 2 d mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps it came naturally given my visual. Of course, yeah. yeah. You know, visual work in the past, but it it, uh, it also my approach in building all of these things has been uh, not to oversimplify anything, but to come up with like a model or a, a mechanism for something, and then being like, okay, that's mm -hmm. how I'm going to do that. So. Um, you know, I have some modules in the notebook that haven't been teased or previewed yet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that will have some wet dry or feedback parallel loop kinds of things going on that mm -hmm. um, when it really comes down to it, guess what? Those are crossfaders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And well, you know what? Uh, I can make a crossfader now. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Not that it's, it's going cool. to be a copy and paste, but you figure some things out about where you're wanting to go and you're like okay well now i'm comfortable with doing something like that with those particular vca chips okay great that's yeah. then a building block of something else that's more complicated so the visual interface and the the usability the whole ui was um i approached with a similar mindset of yeah and i want a system yeah. a method yeah, and, and and then to take it from 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 a user interface perspective into a a more broad user experience um, approach as well. So one of the key things that I've come to love um, of the MT2D after I filmed the actual video is the the visual feedback you you get from the actual <laughs> from the actual tubes. And, yes, and that that is one thing that I've truly come to appreciate because it is so reactive and it becomes so so natural to to use that within your um, uh, your workflow. And the comparison I then want to make is uh, with that visual feedback that we get from the tubes with some of the. Uh, the make noise modules that have LEDs and, and tell you exactly where we are and how the CV is flowing. 
and is that something that you are looking to incorporate in, in, in another modules as well where you say okay well we've had the the mc2d where the actual visual feedback came natural because of the the tubes but is that something that you are also thinking about the the visual feedback to the actual operator uh yes although my vision for um for like LED feedback is mm -hmm. for the LEDs to tell you what the CVs are doing. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what you cannot hear. Of course, yeah. And everything I've, you know, put into the CGF4 and the MC3A, that's the, the LEDs tell you what the incoming CVs are up to. Mm -hmm. And they don't really tell you anything about the audio, and that, that is a somewhat conscious. Well, no, it's definitely a conscious decision that I thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like visual feedback a lot, but I also sort of want to enforce some listening, and um, yeah. and maybe even some tactile feedback, like with the crossfader. I mean, well, you know which side, if you're doing it manually, you know which side you're on because the mm -hmm. knob you know, has a stop to it. And you're like, okay, well, I've reached the end of that. I, I don't need an LED for that. Or No, 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 absolutely. That's, of course, something right. that is very natural. And that's one of the beauties of having that phys physical interface where you can sure. turn a knob uh, as opposed to doing that on a, on a computer where you truly you know when you reached its end yeah right and i didn't put leds on the inputs for the crossfader module because i thought well you know what mm -hmm. you can hear when they're balanced yeah uh, yeah i mean i mean i don't need to look at that so that I, I i used to think like you know what really warrants visual feedback in a modular system and for me that that's the philosophy it's like well i can't hear CVs exactly. Mm -hmm. You hear the results, so you can infer what's going on. But uh, obviously, but you, especially if you have a complicated patch and you're trying to remember, like you know, which alpha <laughs> did I send over there? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, then you need it. Yeah, that, that's where to me the visual feedback is most most engaging um, and most helpful. And so that's always the question I ask before I stick an LED something on something is, can I hear that? Mm -hmm, and if, mm -hmm. if I can hear it, I'm probably not going to give it an LED. So the tube might end up being a little bit of an outlier in that regard. But I agree, however, that that is kind of an interesting case where the flicker of the tube really does kind of give you a little extra something. Well, on the one hand, it's of course it's it's aesthetics, of course. But on the other hand, it also tells you a bit about so how active is this tube currently. Where am I with the global settings on the um, uh, on the on the module as a whole? So where mm -hmm. where am I ending up at? I do see that we do get a comment from Christian. Um, Christian mentions here it also has its gotchas. What if the input levels are different? Do you build an actual level meters to make the visuals equal? Unless it's super clear what the visual feedback represents, it might actually be more harmful than helpful. That is a uh, that, that's an interesting point, Christian. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with that. Yeah, it's, absolutely. I I think also um, you know, to the point of being occasionally more harm than than benefit is uh, maybe someone who's new can get a little bit of information overload yeah or depend too much on visual feedback mm -hmm. or visual information instead of just learning to trust their uh, their ears yeah right okay. and, and i will say i see in forums that i try not to read too much <laughs> <laughs> that's a healthy forum. approach yeah <laughs> yeah forums can can be a rough time sometimes and yeah. uh there are certainly people out there who overuse the, you know, use your ears idea. It's like, well, visual feedback is a good thing. Yeah. To a point. Um, but I think that's a very good point that, you know, you really need to consider what 
what information is important in any given patch, in any given module, in any given moment even. Like, you know, something that was important while you were setting up a patch may no longer be interesting to you once you've, you know, you're 10 minutes into a performance and things are kind of moving along. Yeah. Something that was very crucial as you were like first figuring out where you wanted to go is now not not as meaningful. So if you have too too many lights trying to grab your attention, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there is so much try. as too much of a good thing. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. No great. So that is um, what well, we've so we've gone way over time, Graham and I. I we uh, one of the things that we, we we will need to do is we will need to uh, schedule a follow up meeting because I think that um, we still have a lot of uh, stories to uncover. And I've uh, sure, but but I do want to uh, open it up for the for the audience that has already been quite. <laughs> quite okay with us running a bit longer than than usual um, so I uh, do want to open it up to the audience uh, you know the drill uh, just raise your hand and um, uh, if you have any questions if you are unable or unwilling to uh, do it on stage feel free to uh, drop your question or your comments in the companion channel like Christian just did and um, yeah this is your time and in the meantime, while people are uh, thinking about uh, all of this, um, I always have one question that I do need to ask everyone on this show. And that is, of course, well, um, what would be your number one as number one piece of advice that you would give someone starting off with your Iraq? Uh, this was, of course, a question that I start that I <laughs> that I introduced when I first started these interviews, but I can no longer say that I'm starting within your Iraq. But still, it, it does uncover some some great thoughts from people. So what would be your number one piece of advice? Hmm, that's you know, it's I'm not trying to evade it, but it's a tough one because it mm -hmm. really depends, I think, on where someone's coming from. Um, so if like someone's, you know, very comfortable on mm -hmm. analog synth keyboards, well, that might be a different answer if someone's coming purely from mm -hmm. software environment, it, it might be slightly different. Like, like, so that's why I'm thinking, okay, well, what actually reaches across all backgrounds, all, you know, all yeah. spectrum of... I think it, it, it probably has something to do with, I was about to say purpose, but mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm. it really goes back to method, is find out how you want to, how you want to engage with the instrument. And that will lead a lot of places. Like It'll, it'll rule out certain things and make other things more clear. It's like, you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that this, this is an interaction between your brain and your body and this chunk of hardware and not necessarily getting caught up on like, oh, well, I hear this filter is popular or, you know, everyone has that particular CV generator or something. Well, that yeah. may or may not actually be meaningful to what a person's trying to do. So I think maybe that's it. You know, always never forget that it is actually personal and the way in which you interact with that with that instrument is also is also uh, personal and I, exactly. I like how that translates back to the the whole user experience user interface uh, usability uh, story and approach that you've taken to your modules as well so I uh, no, that's great that that's great advice Graham thank you thank you so much yeah, that, that's actually, it's an interesting question that, I'll be honest, I um, maybe haven't thought about as much as one should. Well, that, that's the reason why I asked it. So I do want mm -hmm. to get the <laughs> the raw and uncut and unprepared question, answer from people. Uh, <laughs> well, there's so much that we can take for granted as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So we did get a comment from, from G's Max. Uh, that was a wonderful discussion. Always love hearing everyone's experience and thoughts on Modular. Thank you for sharing both your thoughts and experiences. Um, yeah, perfect. Thanks, G's. 
Um, so I haven't seen any raised hands yet. Um, so as always, if you do have any follow-up questions after the show, uh, feel free to um, to reach out to me or to Graham directly here on on Discord, and we'll uh, we'll pick this up afterwards. Um, as said, this was a show uh, by the Modular Clubhouse, um, which is a combination of a YouTube channel and these interviews on Discord. Um, for now, I do want to thank you, Graeme, for uh, for being our guest here. And we do need to do this again fairly quickly uh, because uh, there is still much more to uncover that I still want to pick your brain on. Um, and of course, we do need to pick this up when the uh, the other modules are uh, being released and, 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 and talk a bit more about those. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining. Well, and thank you so much for bringing me on and uh, apologize if uh, we wandered too far. But <laughs> no, you know I love is. that. Don't you worry <laughs> about that. No, no, no. That's exactly what this show is all about. We do want to get into the, um, into the stories, the, 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 um, um, the stories behind the people, the stories behind the modules, the stories behind the brands, uh, but also to get the know, to, to truly get to know the people um, that we that we interact with through the community and make sure that we have a podium for those people to uh, to share their thoughts and wisdoms. Sure thing. And I, and I think also, you know, if I can tack on just a little more to what you sure, were just sure. asking about the... Uh... You know, an advice for someone getting into modular is I was talking to someone a few weeks or you know a week or two ago about mm -hmm. just how people build their systems and when I just said like well I hope we didn't wander too far but th that is kind of the point of modular isn't it <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point I love that yeah absolutely it, 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 I mean you don't get into modular if you're not going to wander around him because um, mm -hmm. someone was talking about like you know just getting like a rack of drum modules and i'm like i mean suit yourself but why wouldn't you just buy a drum machine <laughs> yeah yeah no, but still that that could very well be someone's someone's journey and that's still yeah right. perfect but it was like they really just wanted like some like they were getting the vibe that they wanted to like buy a bunch of drum modules patch mm -hmm. them together and then just leave it and i was like well okay i don't say don't do that because maybe that's how it speaks to you but on the other hand you know, we, we, we have things that already do that in one box at considerably less cost and uh, <laughs> complication. Um, True. But that's I, that's why I guess, you know, the let the wander happen is... True thing. Maybe. Absolutely true thing there. No, I and think I that's... that's, that's to... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and I'd certainly love to come back whenever you might wish to have me again. Don't you worry. We'll set that up, and um, we'll get you back on the show uh, uh, sooner than you might than you might expect. Um, that sounds wonderful. Great. So um, with that, I'm just gonna close this off. Um, I'm gonna stick around online for a bit. So if there's any questions, uh, feel free to just uh, ping me directly for anyone in the audience. Um, for now, I would say thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone for listening back to this later on. And um, for now, please, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you uh, next week. And let me just quickly check whom we're going to have on the show then. Oh, that's great. So um, next week, we're going to have, um, at, at, at least we're going to have Casper uh, from Channel 37 uh, on the show. And I hope that he's going to bring his uh, his partner in crime, Lily, along with him. Um, for those of you who've never seen Channel 37, um, they do great uh, modular uh, DIY videos. Um, they are my compatriots here in the Netherlands. And I'm just going to make sure that we have the link to them here as well. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Christian. They, 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 they are absolutely fantastic. So Casper is indeed a, a Dutch national. I'm not quite sure about Lily, but that's one of the questions that we do have for them. So I'm just going to drop that in the 
chat as well. There we go. So um, already start thinking about what's uh, what's up for next week. And then uh, again, thanks everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.